We developed the Elastic Staff, which consists of four core products that serve as building blocks for developers to engineer search-powered solutions. Elasticsearch is the heart of the stack. It's what stores, searches, and analyzes the data, and is what everything gets built around. Logstash and Beats are ways to rapidly ingest data into Elasticsearch from a multitude of sources simultaneously. Once data is in Elasticsearch, users can visualize it in Kibana to create and share charts, graphs, and dashboards of anything, from network security logs to spacecraft telemetry metrics, or feed that data into a custom UI or application. Today, we offer the following solutions, which are all vertically integrated into the stack. App search, site search, and enterprise search. Logging, metrics, and application performance monitoring, business analytics, and security analytics. We're pleased to welcome you to the AUSA Noon Report, our virtual series featuring senior Army leaders providing important updates on key defense topics. Our host today is AUSA's Vice President for NCO and Soldier Programs and the 15th Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Association Night States Army's Noon Report. We're very glad you've joined us today and appreciate your continued support for our programs and events. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Elastic, for their support of this edition of the Noon Report. Elastic has been a national partner since February of 2020. We thank Elastic for their tremendous support to the Army and to AUSA. If you'd like to learn more about Elastic, check out their link in the handouts tab on the upper right-hand corner of your screen under offers. I'd like to give a brief introduction of our special guest today, Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael A. Grinston, the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army, has served since August of 2019. He's held every enlisted leadership position in artillery, ranging from cannon crew member to the command Sergeant Major. In his role, SMA Grinston is the Army Chief of Staff's personal advisor in all matters affecting the enlisted force. He devotes the majority of his time traveling throughout the Army to observe training and talk with soldiers and their families. SMA Grinston is the public face of the U.S. Army. For more details of his many accomplishments and decorations, you can ac access SMA Grinston's full bio in the handout tab on the upper right-hand corner of your screen. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions for SMA Grinston today, please use the Q&A tab and post your questions in the box at the lower right-hand side of your screen. We'll try our best to answer many of questions that we have time for today. and We will get to the conversation started after a little fireside chat between myself and the SMA. But if we don't get to all your questions, we'll make sure that SMA Grinston and his office receive each and every one of them. So let's get started. SMA, welcome back to the Noon Report. And thanks again for taking the time to be here with us today. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me here today. It's a, it's a great day. It's a, the sun's shining, so I'm happy to be here. Well, uh, <laughs> um, with all the events going on, it's not like you had much more to do, I guess, right? So there's a Just lot a of little things, going on. A little, little, little bit going on, yeah. I know. Um, but SMA, you know, uh, thanks again, because I know your time's important and it's important to us, and it's also important to our viewers to hear your thoughts. SMA, I'd, I'd like to start with uh, something that happened here recently in Washington, D.C., and it's a tough discussion, but I think it's important that we have it today. That's the violence we saw in D.C. last week. Can you tell us what was the Army's response to that, and what are we doing in the future? Yeah, I, I think um, I usually say, you know, not everybody gets uh, to be the Sergeant Major of the Army during, you know, a global pandemic, but, you know, <laughs> so uh, I keep saying they're keep the, uh, Keep going with these first and these first and here's another one. These are like you said, it's, these are tough conversations. And, you know, when when you watch what happened in the Capitol, uh, it was tough to watch. Um, I think um, we all were sitting there going, man, this is uh, this is tough to to absorb. And but our response is, you know, I just want to say how proud I am uh, for the soldiers of the National Guard, especially the D.C. National Guard. Um, they were requested. 
uh, they came in and they did the mission that we asked them to do, and they uh, and they did a phenomenal job. And I'm really proud of how they they've uh, they've done and are continually uh, doing. Um, but as I even go through these conversations, like you said, it's a tough conversation, you know, um, with my own family. It's like I just remind everyone, you know, the role of the National Guard. It's you know they're citizen soldiers. They're not, you know, they have jobs, they have family, and there's other things they do. Um, when we request, they're going to be there and they're going to be ready for whatever we ask them to do. If we don't get the request, you know, I can't just say, hey, let's give me five more of those without a little bit more. We need uh, time to respond from the National Guard. But they have just done a phenomenal job in everything that they've done. And this was no, that was no difference. And I'm really proud of the D.C. National Guard and all the guardsmen that are here in D.C. right now. So it's my understanding, man, that there's going to be a pretty significant presence of guard here in the near future in the city. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, uh, we're still getting the requests um, from all the agencies that are requesting them. There's a, a process for that, and they we can we still we're still getting them today. We got them yesterday, and we're still trying to build and um, get the requests that we need, and you know get those folks alerted. Like I said, citizens and soldiers, um, and there's a lot of things going on. There's still yeah, still got COVID. Um, they have state responsibilities, and so there's all these things that we're going through. We get those requests and the National Guard Bureau has done a phenomenal job trying to fill those requests. So, yeah, we're, we're still meeting all the requirements that we've been asked to do. There's still more coming in. Uh, we're going to we're going to continue to look at those as they come in. Well, thank you, SMA. We appreciate you talking about that. It's uh, very important. So, Sergeant Major, we had uh, both the National Guard CSM and the Army Reserve Command Sergeant Major here to talk about 2020, the year in <laughs> review. Um, and I, I'm not going to say it because it sounds cliche-ish at this point, but 2020 is behind us. But it is important to talk about what did the Army do in 2020 and what happened? Yeah, it's been an incredible year. And it, it's almost like it, there's some things that happen that we almost feel like, you know, did that actually happen in 2020? <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, I usually go back to 2019. It kind of started, I mean, it's personal for me is, you know, and on um, – Christmas Day, you know, we had a dignified transfer. We had soldiers killed in combat, and they, they came back to Dover. And my heart goes out, and condolences to those families. Imagine what happens on Christmas. Well, about six days after that, um, you know, we alerted the 82nd to, you know, be on notice and get ready to go, and we're going to send them to Iraq. And then on 3rd of January, you know, we killed Soleimani. And and then but all this time in January, you know, that's going on, you know, all this tensions with Iran and, and then COVID's going We're like, oh, how's this going to go? So uh, we had the crisis action team up for COVID since January of last year. It's almost been a year that we've actually had this up. That's just January. And then COVID hits the U.S. in March. Um, we have issues at Fort Hood in April. Then um, we in May, we have civil unrest um, and and then. Why do I say all, all that's going on? And then, you know, we start activating the National Guard. We, we were the first ones, the active component, to send, you know, medical treatment facilities in the United States Army up to New York. And then we sent a, a second team over to Washington. And that's, that's, uh, that's going on in March and April. Um, we have civil unrest. Then we, you know, alert the National Guard for all the right reasons um, all across the country. We still got COVID. And then and then you, you get to uh, June and July and then we're saying, how are we going to we still got an obligation as the military to protect the nation. So in June or July, we do our first um, NTC rotation. It's actually a National Guard rotation. So, you know, about 25 states going into California. How are we going to continue to train as an army? And, you know, well, we still got COVID still now in the summer and that's hurricane season. So one of the highest hurricane seasons in the, in the history of the world. Um, still have COVID, still some civil unrest, still have all these things going on. And um, my favorite was um, then we got the forest fires. So we got hurricanes on the East Coast. Well, at the exact same time, we still have COVID. And then on the West Coast, we have forest fires. Um, and I said, well, it's almost at that point, you think, well, I'm in JRTC. They're throwing the kitchen sink at me. What else you got? We'll throw an election, and then you know we keep driving on as as a as a as an army and as an institution, um, and then all those things are going on. And then lastly, in December, we rolled out the independent review for Fort Hood. So 
that's a that's a heck of a, a year. Um, and all while we've continuously met all the demands that the the nation and 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 sometimes the world has asked us to. You know, we still got soldiers overseas, still got soldiers forward deployed, and we're still doing those missions that the army's required us. So, um, what an incredible year! And I just want to I, I want to go back and really. And I said the DC National Guard. I just the the compo two and three. What they have done. It's been all compos. You know, active guard, uh, United States Army Guard, and the United States Army Reserve. They've all done a phenomenal job. But um, what they have done with the Urban Augmentation Task Force for the Army Reserves. Um, what they've done for the hospital centers from the engineers uh, out in the country, and all while you know still being prepared to protect the nation. It's. It's been incredible, and I, I'm, I couldn't be more proud of all the Army, uh, but a special thanks to our Compo 2 and 3 soldiers, especially this year. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I mean, for our audience out there, if you want to know more about that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we just did episodes with both the Guard and the Reserve Sergeant Majors, and you can go online and find those new reports. Gave an incredible update on some of the incredible things that our soldiers have been doing throughout the year of 2020. So our major 2020 is behind us in 2021. Before I get started in what's in the future for the Army for 2021, you mentioned something I think is another tough subject and spending the news quite a bit. And you put a lot of personal attention along with the Secretary and the Chief into Fort Hood. Can you give us an update on the findings of the review of Fort Hood? Um, yeah, that's that was a tough one for all of us, um, you know. Still, my, my heart goes out to the Vanessa Guillen family and what happened uh, to their daughter. Um, and that, you know, and I'm really proud of the secretary. He said, we're going to do an independent review. And, you know, we did that. And one of the toughest things I've done was read the independent review. Um, I, I read it and, and, you know, I can't remember the exact pages, 140, 150 pages. Read every page, I highlighted it. Um, you know, and at the end, we had an outbreak from, um, um, the independent review and, and they said, what's our major at the end? They said, what do you think? I said, I wrote down three words, three words were rage, you know, kind of some anger, you know, or, um, I wrote rage, disappointment and failure, but I have to explain that the rage was, you know, I was upset that, you know, it threw out the report and it's online and, you know, it says NCOs, NCOs, you know, we didn't take care of our soldiers. And I feel like that's in our NCO creed. I'm always going to take care of my soldiers. Uh, so I was I was really ups angry about that disappointment that there was some standards that we we didn't enforce. Uh, we got to the point where we didn't feel like we should enforce those standards. And the biggest word when I say that failure, people will say, well, Sergeant Major, what do you mean by that? It was my failure. Um, I think we from August 2019, I said we want to build cohesive teams. We want to focus in on our sergeants and our staff sergeants. We've had noon sessions where I talked about TIMS, where I want to, you know, fit, disciplined, well-trained, cohesive teams. Um, I didn't see that in a report. Uh, so I felt, how did I, what did I fail to do to communicate is so important for our small unit leaders to understand their people. Um, and I got to communicate more about cohesive teams and we focus in on fit, and that's both mental and physical fitness, uh, disciplined, well-trained, well cohesive teams. So we don't let anything happen to our soldiers, and I'd be willing to do anything for them. And that's in a firefight or if that's a sexual assault, sexual assault, I don't let soldiers harm my soldiers. That's what it means to be in my squad. And I've been communicating that, and I felt like I just – maybe I didn't communicate that enough. I didn't, you know, I didn't check enough. I didn't do – so I was – you know, internalized it. I said that, you know, I, I had some culpability here. Um, but then last week I went to Fort Hood and I've been to Fort Hood several times, um, even through COVID. We're just, my, my goal was um, I wanted to make sure we're, we're still going to rebuild that trust. We're going to be there. We, we, this isn't just an independent review. And then, you know, and then that's kind of done. It's going back and making sure we're going to implement, we're going to, we're going to do better. And my, my goal is to make sure that we're out there doing those things and we're going to do it. Um, I had a really great conversations, uh, E4 and below. And I asked him, I, I asked him a tough question because these aren't, you know, easy questions. I said, do you think I'm here? Just kind of check the box, you know, and they were really honest and it was hard to take it. They're like, yeah, some of them are like, yeah, 
you know. Um, and then, you know, I got, and I went and I asked everyone in the room and one said, absolutely not. I think you actually care. You've taken notes. You did this. So um, it was hard to hear their perceptions and it was theirs and it was honest and it was raw. Um, and that's I, I got to, you know, I got to take that. And we all have to listen to our soldiers. And when they feel that way, um, it's not just get angry about it. Do something about it. Uh, and that, and that's where, again, for me, is to go back and make sure that all the things that we've implemented with Fort Hood, that we're going to do better. Uh, and that's why I was at Fort Hood to say, hey, are we going in the right direction? What else am I missing? Uh, it was about seven, eight hours straight in different rooms, E4 and below, the sergeants, the staff sergeants, all the way up, and uh, lieutenant colonels. So the, the real positive is um, there was a lot of positive in there where they said, we like what you're doing. We like the counseling. We like the interaction with our squad. We like the squad PT. We, we want to do more squad PT. I was like, yes, I like that. Let's do it. More squad PT. So, uh, uh, you know, in those cohesive teams, and, and they were really into that. And they said, we just three months from now, we don't want to go away. So um, I really enjoyed those conversations. And they gave me some really honest feedback. And they gave me some other things I need to look at. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. And the review had some realities that we need to fix and leaders need to come to grips with the fact that we can do better. And you mentioned that several times. That's something I got to ask is you have the scope of the ability to look across the force. Is it isolated only to Fort Hood or are we having concerns and issues in other places? Yeah, we established the People First Task Force to look at all the independent review. And I'm really proud. You know, get General uh, Brito from the, the G1, Sergeant Major Guerra from the G2, and Diane, uh, Mrs. Randon from the G2 also, to take a look at that and say, here's all these concerns. I think it was 70 recommendations. They're going to look at all those. But it's not just to look at Fort Hood and how we can do that in one spot. Is where are we... Um, again, not building those cohesive teams. Where are we doing those things? Where are we, you know, missing it with our soldiers? So this isn't uh, just Fort Hood. Uh, this is every location. We got to constantly make sure. And that's, again, that goes back to what I said, you know, in 2019, I had the exact same thing. We have to know our soldiers. We have to get out. We have to do better with our counseling. We have to make sure we actually listen to what they're saying. And it doesn't mean we don't train them. You know, people first doesn't mean um, that we're not going to train our soldiers. Some of the best cohesive team building things are, you know, I've been in, you know, Grafenberg, Germany. It's really cold and I'm in my sleeping bag. It's pouring down rain. And I'm really glad that, it, you know, we finally got that Gore-Tex thing. So the water doesn't seep through the sleeping bag and it was miserable. That was that's a way to build a cohesive team. <laughs> um, so it's not just, you know. We got to know our soldiers um, in all kinds of ways. And that's where I think we're going with this. And I'm really excited about it. Well, we appreciate you sharing this, our Major. Tough year, tough challenges. Yeah. Great leaders will make a difference by first recognizing that the difference needs to be made. And you guys are doing that, Sergeant Major. So thank you. Um, let's go out to our audience, Sergeant Major. We're getting a lot of questions coming in today. And I know uh, they'd appreciate if we entertain some of those. So the first question is in, in regard to the recent events last week, but actually, talking about something that's much larger. And Haley says, as we see reports of service members and veterans being involved in the events at the Capitol Hill last week, what is the Army going to change going forward to better identify and root out extremism in the ranks? Yeah. Well, we've never had a place uh, where extremism in the ranks was tolerated. Yeah. It's just, um, you know, that's something we, we all disagree with. There's no room for racism and extremism in our ranks. Um, we've we've dealt with this uh, many times since I've been in the army for 32 years. Um, it's just not something we're going to tolerate. Um, but we all, you know, but you know, you have a you know an obligation or a right or what you want to do to protest, you know, peacefully. It's when you do violence and you break a law, you know, that's not what we do as an army. That is not why we serve in the United States Army. Our goal is to protect the people. Um, and serve the nation. And, you know, it's not um, to do violence and criminal activities. Um, and, you know, in any cases of that that we find, uh, like always, we will, we'll look into it. Yeah, I appreciate it. There's some great questions coming in SMA. Ladies and gentlemen, just as a reminder, if you have a question, please click on the Q&A tab. And again, the SMA will answer as many as we can as we have time for today, but he will receive each and every one of these um, so he can look at them. Sergeant Major, our next question is from Eddie. And Eddie says, the Army is a strong family. 
But are we risking cohesion by allowing so many soldiers to be so vocal on social media? <laughs> um, I, I don't, I mean, if soldiers want to express how they feel on social media, um, you, you, they want to reach out. They want us to listen to them. And uh, I, I think where I get, you know, why didn't they reach out to the squad leader? Why didn't they reach out? How come the platoon sergeant didn't reach out? I think that's, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm upset when people reach out on so, social media. I think I'm more upset that they felt like they had to reach out on social media. Were we communicating? Did we do everything that we need to do? So if soldiers are reaching out on social media, normally, you know, that's my going in is saying, what, what do we do um, that lost that, you know, that they feel that they had to do that? Absolutely, Sergeant Adrian. Like you said, I think uh, good leaders, squad leaders, like you always mentioned, this is my squad, would know what their soldiers are doing um, and be the first ones they should be reaching out to. Yeah, absolutely. Sergeant Major, our next question is from Richard. Uh, he says, there's a significant concern on suicidal issue with current and former military personnel. Will there be a greater concentration on this issue, both from funding and command staff? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We've, you know, the vice chief of staff, uh, General Martin and I, we've chaired, I can't remember how many we've chaired, but in the last six months, we've just got everybody on the net and said, this, this is something we need to address. We do, we call it a life worth living. And we bring all the senior commanders, um, you know, and we, we changed the forum. One time I had staff sergeants throughout the globe and I said, hey, what can we do from an army policy to help you, you know, know your soldiers, you know, what can we help you with, with what's going on with suicide? So from a staff perspective, we're looking at this, um, you know, I get the reports every week. We look at it from senior leaders, the vice chief of staff and the sergeant major of the army and all the four stars and all, all the commands throughout the army once a month on the net and say, hey, you know, what can we do? What are we not doing? What are we missing? Um, and then, you know, I want everybody to understand it's okay to seek BRO. We we all need it. And there's still, you know, every once in a while I'll get soldiers, well, you know, it's a stigma. I said, it, you know, if there's a leader out there that still believes this, if your soldiers need help, I look at it like if, you know, if I broke my leg, I go to the hospital and you know, nobody questions it. It's like my leg's hurting. And like I said, fit, uh, you know, mentally and physically fit. I want to be mentally, physically fit. Sometimes I need a tune up um, and everybody needs that. So we don't, you know, we need to constantly message to our soldiers. It's okay to seek behavioral health. Uh, but from a, a staff perspective for suicides, we're doing that. And we're constantly looking at the policies. Do we have this right? Uh, We've got uh, the suicide prevention pilot that was actually, I think it was at Fort Hood, and, and we ran that at Fort Campbell. So we're constantly looking at what else can we do as an Army uh, to stop uh, the suicides. Absolutely. And as we hear the Chief and Secretary say all the time, you know, the priority shifted this, this beginning of this year, people first. Is this an integral part of that nested strategy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I've said this for a couple of years, um, but even more so now in the last, you know, 18 months is when I think uh, people first in a strategy on suicide, this is all, to me, um, what we're looking at is how do, you know, how do we look at, you know, a cohesive team that's fit mentally and physically. And then there's other things, suicide, domestic violence, sexual harassment, sexual assault. You know, if I go through a sexual assault and then I need to get some behavioral health. So how do I? So in other words, how do we build the total soldier in the subset of that would be suicide? So I th we're, we're trying to look at it holistically and not just one program. It, I think uh, a good fit soldier and that that'll funnel down to all the programs. That's what was so important. When I keep going back to my squad and cohesive team is. If we get that overarching right, it's okay to get to Bayer Health. It's okay to do these things, all those other things. And, you know, instead of focusing in right now, we're going to look real hard at suicide. And right now we're going to look over here, uh, build the cohesive team. And I think, and then we'll work down from there as opposed to, hey, we're only going to focus right now on suicide. And then go, oops, we got something else. So, that's how we're trying to look at that, especially with the people first. So build the cohesive team. And then the underlying is, and that's a ready, you know, well-trained cohesive team. And then all those other things, 
you know, kind of that's all where all the mo money and the programs are coming as we build a better, you know, our folks, then all those other things underneath are going to get better. Because it's a people organization. It's all yes, connected yeah. tissue. And like you said, if you focus on the people, you're inherently entertaining all the other issues and concerns yeah. that may consume leadership's time. So get back to doing what we do, like you mentioned earlier, defending our nation, Sergeant Major. Yeah, so absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Back out to our audience, Sergeant Major Johnny says, the Army has been in a war fighting mentality since 2004. And this is almost two generations of leaders who've concentrated on fighting and not leading. Um, what do you need to do to motivate, inspire, or vitalize the senior NCOs to help you get the Army back to taking care of soldiers? <laughs> uh, well, I, I really appreciate Johnny's coming. Out. I'm pretty sure uh, we've been going at this in 2001. <laughs> so I'll give us an extra three years there. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've stopped 20 years. So, uh, um, and I think there's, I think leading in combat is still, you know, is great leadership. So yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't separate the two. You know, there's, you know, I'm in combat. I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm leading. <laughs> so, um, but how does that translate to leadership? in a garrison environment. Um, so it still takes great leaders and a lot of time. And I think that was, that's what we're trying to, to equate to is that these leadership traits still equate to, if I'm on a FOB and my soldier calls for help, and says, I need help right now. You know, I, you know, a lot of us has been there. We just picked on a gear and you go. So, but when your soldier, when you're back and you're sitting with your family and this soldier says, I need help, it's the same thing. That's leadership. Okay, we're going we're gonna to go out there. I'm going to get them to your house. I'm not going to wait. It's right now. It's urgent. I'm coming. Um, to me, that's the same mentality. But we, for, I think that's part of the problem is we try to separate the two. It's not. It's the same exact concept of we're going to. We're going to go out there and take care of you, whether that's a firefight or something else. And it's going to be right now. And I would do anything, you know, to make sure nobody harms my soldier. That's the exact same, uh, in my opinion, that we need to do. And that's what I've been harping on. I often said that people would say, you know, he's a good garrison soldier. Or he or she is a good garrison leader. And I said, there's no such thing. There's good leaders. And the environment changes and leaders and soldiers adapt to the environment. Right. Absolutely. So, well, thank you, Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major, out to uh, Patrick. Patrick says, how will the Army respond to the Senate's request? And this comes up every single time you and I sit down in the chair or on the microphone, Sergeant Major, so you know it was coming. How will yeah. they respond to a Senate's request to reevaluate the ACFT? And how will the Army show that PRT will improve performance on the ACFT and that patience is required? Um Okay. Yeah, it's like uh, I've always prepared for this question, so I really appreciate it. And again, yeah, I'm more than welcome to, to continue to talk because fitness, uh, physical fitness, is it's still, important. It's, it's still extremely important. It's important. Um, mm -hmm. So the independent, you know, they asked to do an independent review. So I, you know, I, I think I'm a soldier. I'm pretty simple. You know, you tell me to do this, this is what we're going to do. So we 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 got the panel together. Uh, there's going to be an independent review. I, I I think the first touch point is March. Um, the second touch point, I can't remember, it's May. So we, we got three touch points that I saw throughout the year and then a final report in December 21. So we're pretty much, we're doing what we've said to do. And, you know, the ACFT is, has evolved. That's why we called it 2.0. Um, the latest, you know, it may be 3.0. And, we're, you know, we're going to look at that and say, hey, how are we doing? And that's why. And that's mean, this is not new. To the, no. The APFT no. changed numerous times. Numerous times. Numerous. Um, yeah. And a lot of you, you and I remember, you, yeah. know, um, you know, 17 to 21 for the old APFT in order to max that was 11.54 on the two-mile run. Um, that was that was a little bit more challenging. Uh, <laughs> nobody was, you know, we're like, woo, 13 minutes. You know, <laughs> that's easy. You know, we gave us an extra minute. So. APFT evolved yeah. over time. The ACFT evolved over time. Um, now, the second part, have we improved fitness? Um, we have reports, uh, you know, from basic training and AIT that started doing the ACFT that this is improving our fitness. You know, we're seeing less, you know, musculoskeletal injuries. Um, and that's our goal. The goal for the ACFT was to make our Army stronger and have less injuries, not any other reason. That's the only purpose is to make the Army better and stronger. But we implemented, you know, the PRT manual, but we didn't change the PT test and we keep going back. So if I have a test with push-ups, sit-ups, and run, 
that's, I got to do that. And, you know, so this is really important to actually move the army forward with a, you know, a more physically fit army and have less injuries. And that's why this is so important. So um, we got the independent review. Uh, we're, we're doing exactly what we're told and, and we'll look at it just like we have for the other, you know, 32 years I've been in the army. Well, thanks for that update, Sergeant Major. It, it is important. Fitness is one thing that we do every single day, and it's a critical aspect of what soldiers do. Sergeant Major, uh, back to our audience. Brett says, S. Major Vincent, thank you for your time and your service. And uh, what are some ways the Army can ensure junior leaders are in position long enough to develop trusted relationships with their soldiers? High turnover can inhibit trust when soldiers watch their squad leaders leave in 12 months or less. Yes. Uh, and Brad, I agree. <laughs> so we put in a lot of things um, in, in the last year that, you know, are really, and some of the staff sergeants are not exactly excited about when it, um, the timing grade for staff sergeants last year's promotion was to get looked at for sergeant first class was 18 months. And this year it's 36 months. <laughs> so it was like, sir, major, you doubled it. I said, I know I did. Um, so we wanted to, really baseline in your, you know, remember I said well-trained. I want staff starting that's well-trained, but they have to be present. And if they're getting promoted so quickly, they don't get a chance. I, I, I say I want them to have time to have two turns. You know, I want them to do a turn as a squad leader and then, you know, a couple of years as a drill sergeant. So if they get promoted or they're selected for promotion at 18 months, did they get a chance to be a squad leader or at that their MOS in their field, and they have to be present. So we're doing some things with time and grade, but also we we, we rebalanced. Uh, we had fifty about fifty five percent of our staff sergeants were in trade on. And if you have more than this area, then you have the operational force. It's almost like we couldn't build them fast enough, and then they go over here. Um, so a thousand NCOs by the end of this FY. So by October, we'll come rebalance that from TRADOC back into the operational force. Again, a thousand NCO staff sergeants back in your units, that'll help us moving the staff sergeants in and out. So some had their orders uh, deleted and said, hey, you're not gonna go. Some said, hey, you know, so we didn't wanna rush to that. Um, so. I agree, and we look at it all the time of how long they have. Time in grade, time in position, is that's what I'm really focused in on. I'm still going to keep looking at that. We're not we're not completely there yet, but I'm really in tune that we have to have staff sergeants present. Uh, if we don't, um, it's hard to you know talk about my squad if I don't have a squad leader. <laughs> Absolutely, it's our major yes. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your questions. We're getting a lot of questions in, and these are phenomenal questions for the Sergeant of the Army. Again, if we don't have time today. What I will ask you to do is I will be uh, with Sergeant Major on a podcast at the end of this month, and we will carry some of these questions over, Sergeant Major, if you're okay with that, to yeah, our sure, podcast absolutely. series. And you can tune into those podcasts at AUSA.org. They're free for download anytime. So we'll have SMA on there at the end of this month. But SMA, back to our questions. Quinn says, and this is a good one for the families, has the Army looked into stabilizing soldiers and their families at a duty station for much longer with a focus on improving the quality of life of the Army people strategy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'd be, you know, if you've actually been with the chief, you know, a couple of times, it's like, hey, we need to get out of the old mantra of just moving people to move people. So, um, you know, why am I on orders? You know, uh, you know, just, you know, why am I moving? So um, we've gone back to HRC and said, we don't need to do that. But what we've also done in the assignment satisfaction key and listed marketplace. So, um, you know, we got the officers aim. I think they're at 2.0 where, you know, here's how we're going to do assignments for the officers and here how we're doing for enlisted. So one of the key buttons in there was I don't want to move. <laughs> so there's a stabilization when you go to if you come up and they we have requirements for the Army. So if you've been on station for three years and you do have that, you know, two years as a staff sergeant, time and grade, time and position, and you may be available. Well, you know, uh, I said, hey, I went back to HRC, make sure there's a button that says, I don't want to move. Um, so I think a lot of people, when we opened the marketplace for enlisted, said, oh, wait a minute, I have to move. 
so I went back and a message to everybody right now. If you don't go back, if that button's not there, you don't see it, let me know. We'll go back in. But I keep messaging this is that just because you're available to move doesn't mean you have to. move. Uh, and if any leaders or anyone finds that they're having issues, please run that through your NCO support channel or send it to me. And we'll take a look at it. That's not the intent. Not to, we, the intent is not to move, just to move people around. But remember, there are a lot of requirements. Um, and a good quality staff sergeant, we still have to do fill those staff sergeant drill sergeants. And that's a valid requirement. It's high demand. You know, yeah. as you talk, Sergeant Major, I'm thinking, you know, we always say the critical element is a squad leader. You're exactly right. That's the, that's the entry point to the relationship between a leader and their soldier. Yeah. And uh, But they're also in high demand all across the army. Everybody wants more squad leaders. Everybody does. So, um, but I know the army's working hard yeah. to make sure that we're minimizing um, the need to unnecessarily move people. Yeah. That's around. my, that's my favorite. Uh, you know, when I go to, you know, special operations command, I need your best staff sergeants and then I'll go to <laughs> the recruiting command SMA. I just need you to send me the best staff sergeants and then I'll go to the, you know, the drill sergeants. Like, you just, I just need my best. And then we'll go to the, SFA, the security forces. history. I just need your best staff sergeants. So, so there's no request <laughs> so, second or third. Yeah, so, just your best. Um, <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of requirements. Um, uh, and, and we take a look at that too, or do we have too many requirements? So Major, before we go back out to the next question, you had mentioned talent management. I thought it important to talk that you've been working that enlisted talent management task force pretty hard lately. And with a lot of new initiatives coming out now, and the talent management task force is going to be on the noon report at the end of the month. But can you just tell us, are you happy with where we're headed with enlisted talent management? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm extremely happy with where we're going with talent um, um, assessment. You know, this is really important. And I've said this a couple of times. I mean, we can do all the policies we want in the United States Army. And if we don't have leaders that implement those policies the right way, it's not going to work. It's like, you know, leadership matters. You know, you can write it and then if people don't execute it, that's why we got to get the leaders right. Um, that's why this assessment program is so important. And we, we we've we've been working on this, you know, you know, you were working on it and I'm working on it. So, you know, we really, really put a lot of focus in, you know, in November, we had the SARB major assessment uh, prototype. We sent 31, 32 SARB majors to go through the battalion commander's assessment program. So they went through the whole program and we got a lot of good feedback. And then we did in December, the, the first sergeant's assessment program. And so we've run one of those and I know in Korea they're doing this now and there's nothing stopping you from, you know, eighth army going, Hey, I'm going to do an assessment. Um, we're going to just, we're trying to do this writ large for the army, but some units are like, this is great. Um, you know, how can I just go ahead and implement this right now? So, so we did the, the pilot there at Fort Bragg and I know they have some great feedback on when they do the thing, but, um, you know, we're really moving away ahead because, you know, how do we pick, and assess and get the right leaders right there. We get the policy right. We get uh, great leaders for our soldiers. Uh, and we just continue to get better and better. Yeah. And for updates on the talent management efforts of both our officers enlisted, you can visit the Army's website on talent management, but also you could tune in here at the end of the month for our new report specifically focusing on talent management with your task force. They're going to be here firsthand to answer all the tough questions, Sergeant Major, that we're <laughs> going to get on that. But thanks for that quick update. So, Major, back to our audience. Tyler says, what resources would you recommend to a company or battalion command team trying to encourage, this is my squad amongst their leaders? And I'm glad this came up because I wanted to talk about it because I'm a huge fan of it. This is my squad. Tell us what's up. Yes. Um, I, I would send you no further than probably your NCO Academy. So there's already blocks of instruction in the basic leader course on this is my squad. So they've already got all the POIs. They got all the instructions. You could just take that. And it's like, well, Sergeant Major, if they're doing that, why would I take that? Well, because we just started that in October. So if you had a, a somebody that went to BLC, I don't know, three years ago or your platoon sergeant, they had, you know, they haven't gotten those. Take that off the shelf and start with, here's what we're doing in the basic leader course. Do all my NCOs know that? It's a really good block of instruction. So the NCO Academy has a block of instruction on this is my squad. It found, you know, it's how, like, how do you build trust with us? How do you build a team? And that trust, um, that's in the basic leader course. That, that's usually my go-to. It's right there. Uh, and it's and they've done a lot of good work from trade-off. It's put that out. Well, thank you, Sergeant Major. So our next question comes from Justin, and it's pretty specific. He says, uh, in the recent days, snipers have asked for an MOS. Have you mentioned reviewing an opportunity for an MOS? Is there any update on that? 
<laughs> yeah. I think the sniper, I don't think we've asked, I don't think I've been asked for an MOS lately. It's usually about the badge. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe there is a request for an MOS. I haven't seen that. So um, I, I still think the fundamental skill of a sniper is still resonant into, you know, having a special skill identifier. Um, you know, I think, you know, as we look at this, you know, they do a phenomenal work, you know, and it's a tough job and it's, it's rigorous training and, and it's hard. And so, but uh, we've not looked at having a special MOS uh, for that skill set. Yeah. So I'm going to do another good one. I think it's an important topic to reinforce and it's something you touched on the last time we were together in these chairs is Derek says, SMA, just want to thank you for being so open about your racial struggles. What feedback have you received from soldiers pertaining to this? I had, um, now I received a lot of feedback. <laughs> so, um, and I really appreciate it all. I mean, um, I didn't know how my story related to a lot of people. Um, I just, that's number one, but you know, I had, you know, folks say, Hey, I had these, you know, similar questions. You know, I grew up this way. Um, maybe it was in, um, one, you know, person said, Hey, I, I grew up in America, but I'm, you know, Korean descent and, you know, people judge me by the color of my skin and that's what it's all about. So um, we continue. Those are, again, those tough questions that we all need to have. And, and, you know, with our squad, and I think that's really important that we just continuously, we can't forget that every year in the United States Army, we have 130,000 soldiers leave active guard and reserve every year. So those tough conversations on racism that we had a year ago, we need to have those again. We have to know our people. We have to say, how did you grow up? How did, welcome to my team. Let's talk. Um, so that's got to, that doesn't just go away. We got to, we got to, again, get to know our people, how we receive them in our organizations. But these tough questions didn't, you know, like happen last May and then they go away. This needs to happen as you build a new teammate. And again, 130,000 in the active guard and reserve will join the army uh, next year, every year. Yeah, thanks, so many. So many. Our next question is from Andrew, and uh, and it, back to the tough subject that we started with. In light of the Fort Hood and the statements from the report, how has interaction with service members on social media benefited you and the other senior leaders of the army? But, you know, the uh, the dialogue on social media, um, you know, it depends, sometimes it depends on which site you go to. Um, so I, I think it's still building the openness that we're willing to have these tough conversations. Um, I would obviously prefer to have those tough conversations in person. I'd rather look at people in the eye. But if you're reaching out in social media, we do our best to address that. Um, you know, we can look at those and if we see something con concerning, we always, you know, we see things all the time. Like, oh, this, this has me worried. Maybe there's something more, but I still would prefer social interaction, looking someone in the face. How emotional are they about this topic? What really bothers them? And I can't see that in a text or a post or a, a meme or something. It's, it's important to, to know and look at folks. So, we do engage in social media and, and I think that's, you know, clearly that's never, you know, it's not going away anytime soon. We got to do that. Um, but my preferred and for everybody and every leader is if you find something there, let's try to reach out and, and look people in the eye and see, Hey, this is, these are people on the backside of that. And if they have a true concern, let's talk to the individual, not through a text or a post. Absolutely. So I'm going to our next question comes from Fred and Fred says, SMA in the near future. Will the Army be taking a look at a family-oriented program specifically for married Army couples, an exceptional family member program to ensure correct utilization and implementation of both of those programs? Uh, yeah, we, I think we're we're constantly evaluating, you know, both of those programs. I will, I'll mention the second one, you know, first, the exceptional family member program. You know, as my travels prior to COVID was a little bit easier that I was doing um, – Fort Campbell, I did one with the Exceptional Family Member Program. I said, well, how are we doing? Um, are we getting the stabilization right? Did we send you? And we found some things that we needed to do a little better. So uh, we're constantly evaluating this. And and even looking back uh, at DOD, you know, because we have joint bases, you know, is, is the service same? Can we provide that at 
you know, joint base San Antonio, uh, same thing. You know, if we say the family goes there, is there a difference in the programs, not just in the Army, but on this installation that may not be Army? So not only are we looking at it from an EFMP program from an Army perspective, it's from a DOD perspective so that when we go to this joint base, say, hey, I can go there. What does that mean? Is that, you know, 50 miles of travel? Is that 20 miles of travel? You know, why would it, you know, why would the Air Force it be? I'm not saying that is different, but that's just one example of that care. Is it, you know, 10 minutes away or is it two hours away? And why would that be different across services? So um, we're, we're still looking at that and it's, it's not falling off the radar. It's just hard for me, again, to bring families together. And I have, you know, so, you know, physically distanced, wear a mask. I've done a few of those, but I'm very cautious that we're still in a COVID environment. Um, so we're still finding ways to get some of that really good feedback, but we're, we're still looking at it. And for the married army couple program, I think that's just goes back to, you know, the enlisted marketplace, you know, um, do we have that in there? Um, do we have that uh, system in that says, hey, I'm in the married army couple program. And most people just, you know, reminder for the enlisted, we have five manning cycles. For officers, it's two manning cycles. So, you know, there's a lot of manning cycles that we have to go through. And we got to make sure that uh, we do want to marry up families. Again, if we don't get it right, you know, please go to your leaders and bring that up and say, hey, you know, you just sent my wife over here and I'm over here and we're not going to get the be back together for the next few years. Um, sometimes we don't know. Just please don't think that, you know, we're, we knew it all and we're really bad people. I just ask. Um, it's important that we get that right. And if we if we miss something, please bring that up to your NCO support panel or your chain of command. Thanks, SMA. Ladies and gentlemen, we do our have a limited time today. So we have time for one more question, but I encourage you though. So you have a question, keep writing. We'll keep them. Again, we'll carry those to our next venue with the SMA, which will probably be a podcast, but we can always invite you back for another noon report. SMA. I'm <laughs> yeah, sure that okay. you'd love to come back on our show. Um, and it's an important one and it's from Abigail. And I think it's important that we uh, discuss with, and what her question is, she wants to address gender difference in the army. Do you think okay. there's an issue or concern with that? And how is the Army looking at it and addressing it? And specifically, she asked in relation to the findings of the Fort Hood situation. Um, well, specifically uh, to the Fort Hood, I mean, we just, in the Fort Hood, there wasn't, you know, when I read it, it was, you know, writ large. We had, you know, allowed, you know, an environment for sexual assault and sexual harassment. And it didn't say, you know, male and female. And of course, um, you know, you know, that is always a concern, but we're, mm -hmm. Um, we're looking um, at all the policies, just like we've always looked at policies. Um, I just reviewed what what we do in the 670-1 for here, and we're going to do a big announcement uh, for some changes on the 21st of January. So we got to get the X order right. We're going to roll that out. So we're always looking at, you know, do we have it right uh, in our policies? Um, Fort Hood brought some things to light, so we're going to look at that. That's why, again, the People First Task Force. But you know, there's other things that have come to light more, you know, um, not more, but I can go back to May and say, hey, are, do we have all these things right, you know, racially? You know, we took out the photos. Um, do, do we have some kind of thing in there when I looked at a photo and that, you know, changed my decision on how I'd vote that record? So I think uh, in the last year, all of that, not just Fort Hood, has brought some light, some things that maybe we need to do. And one of those things, like taking out the photos, that we've already done. Um, we reviewed some of the air policies and we'll put that out. So there's, there's all those things that we're looking at um, to make sure that uh, uh, we do have equality and inclusion in our ranks. Yeah. Well, Sergeant Major, we appreciate your time today and it's very valuable and we know you're incredibly busy. Got to get back to the things of 2020, 20, I mean, 2021. Uh, I know it was going to be a better year, um, but thank it's you. A, Dan, it's already a better year. And I, I know, <laughs> okay. I know there's some really adamant football fans out there, but I am from Jasper, Alabama. We did win. There's probably bets on whether I was going to say roll tide today. So um, I had to go out there. So, uh, you know, it was a good game last night. So it's already better for me. So, but we still have a long way to go. We have a lot of things. You to mentioned work on. a lack of sleep when you came in. Was this the call? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I cannot confirm or deny that I watched <laughs> the football game. And because fitness is important, I still got up and did my PT this morning. That's so. right. As did I, Sergeant Major. Well, thank you again for your time. And we look forward to having you on the show in the future. And I know we will. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to transition before we close today to talk about some of our upcoming events here at AUSA. Could you please join us at 19 January for the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, General James McConville, in the same form, the noon report, live interactive questions with the Chief. On 22 January, an AUSA Thought Leader series with Kevin Maurer, offer of the Rock Force. On 3 February, the AUSA noon report with General Christopher Cavoli, uh, Commanding General of U.S. Army Europe and Africa. And ladies and gentlemen, mark your calendars for Global Next, 16 to 18 March 2021, and you'll be receiving registration information shortly. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, save the date for AUSA 2021 annual meeting and exposition here in Washington, D.C.'s Convention Center, 11 through 13 October. We look forward to hosting you at this year's AUSA convention. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time today, and we appreciate your membership. And those of you that are members, membership is important. If you'd like to become a member or find out how to, please visit AUSA.org. This membership matters. It brings programming like you saw today, but it takes care of soldiers, their families, and our veterans. Good luck to each and every one of you. And Sergeant Major, thanks again for joining us today. Goodbye.